Thank you, Mr. Call, and uh, greetings, everybody. It's a delight to be out here again with the, the ABC choir of uh, Corral, sorry. Uh, it is a Corral. Uh, being dean of students now at ABC, it's, it's been a privilege to work with this class and uh, to get to listen to them rehearse. My office is right at the end of the hall near the uh, entrance to the meeting room and right, right just across from the door to where the Council of Elders meets in the conference room. But when they're practicing all through the first semester and, and even now they practice regularly, I can hear them down the hall from in the lecture hall where they're singing or if they have the section practic practicing their sectional parts, uh, they'll do that in the conference room sometimes and it has been a delight to get to hear the pieces of this basically Sabbath concert that uh, they perform for you here to the glory of God and it certainly was. Uh, I, I think my favorite one right now and if it wavers between the, the, uh, the last one and this one but the God of Angel Armies is the uh, the song that uh, I love, but I liked, I liked them all. I thought you were a marvelous voice. It was really inspiring for all of us. And we need to hear beautiful songs sung and to be uplifted and inspired by it. Oh, I did want to uh, add just a, a, a tidbit of announcements. We have the uh, annual uh, Ambassador Bible Center Continuing Education Seminar, the long one that we have during uh, one week during June. Uh, the date for that this year is June 16 to 20, in case you would like to come down for it. Uh, the tuition is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, I think $75, uh, $80 for a married couple, uh, $80 for the two of them for a married couple. So that's uh, June 16 to 20, if you would like to join us for that. Seating is limited. We will pretty much cap out at about 65 participants. We reached that last year and the year before. Uh, so if you're thinking of that, it would be good. You, you, what you do is you get a sample of the Bible classes that we teach at ABC uh, from various, the various uh, instructors. Also, with the, uh, the Women's Weekend in Cincinnati, is, as was mentioned, is coming up. And some may have wondered whether or not we're going to have the Vertical Thought Bible class, which we've been doing on a, a monthly basis on a Friday night. And the answer is yes, we are. Uh, most of uh, the girls, I believe, will be at the Women's Weekend, which is fine. Uh, we're going to address an interesting topic. It's entitled, Man to Man. How does Jesus Christ define man today? Man to man. How does Jesus Christ define man today? I think it's timely, it's important, and uh, so that's what we'll be covering at that time. Mr. Fenchel and I will be doing the tag team presentation. Uh, one month I do the presentation, the next month, which was uh, February, he does a presentation, and then the third month, we, we do it together. So uh, we're, this is the, the tag team uh, instruction that we'll have that day. So I was, just wanted to touch on those and uh, mention that Ambassador Bible Center is going well this year. We're looking forward to another class next year and re beginning to receive uh, the applications. If any of you out here have been wanting to go and this is the year that you're thinking of it then be sure to uh, check with us about an application. I thought I would start uh, the the message today. I'll work into what the title is and, and I think you'll find that it's interesting. It always inspires me. But I was mulling over a passage in Ecclesiastes 7. A good name is better than precious ointments. A good name and we don't just mean the name, a really cool name like, um, I don't know, uh, what's Mr. Gildersleeve's first name? I've forgotten. On the old radio show. Well, Gildersleeve is a name, you know. I don't know if that's a good name, uh, but it, that's not really what name means here. It, it means your reputation, who you are. It's more than just the sound of the words. What you don't notice in that verse, that's verse 1 of chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes, is there's a Hebrew word play. And believe it or not, there are at least 500 puns in Hebrew in the Old Testament alone, at least. I have a collection of 500 of them. This is one of them. The word for name is she'im. In English letters, we would spell it S-H-E-E-M, S-H-E-E-M. And the name, the word for ointment is shemen, S-H-E-M-E-N. So it's, I don't know, just one of those 
marvelous word plays that gives us a little insight into the divine sense of humor that God the Father and Jesus Christ share and have shared with us. That's why humanity was created with a divine sense of humor or with a sense of humor where it's not always divine in our case. It goes on to say, in the day of death is then the day of one's birth. The good name is better than precious ointment. I don't know what we would consider to be precious ointment these days. When I was a kid and it was 10 below zero when we were milking cows outside, bag balm was a precious ointment <laughs> for the cow and for my hands, you know. Uh, but we, we have precious ointments with poisons in them today. So it, you, you have to think of something that's really got the pure ingredients, really nice lotion or something. Yeah, it's truly magnificent of fragrance and, and a healing power for the skin, that sort of thing. So a good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death and one's birth. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, and it seems like a dichotomy, but that's what God says, for that is the end of all men. And the living will take it to heart. So there's something we learn. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. It is strengthened. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. We all face troubles and trials, and certainly you all, and, and especially the Shoemaker family, have faced a trial that is expressed by these poignant verses. And sometimes we need a boost. We know that God loves us, but how exactly can we picture that love of God in our mind? You know, what can we look at in the scripture that gives us a perspective? Maybe not a, a list of instructions, but gives us a picture. You know how a magnificent portrait is something you can stand and look at and admire and admire and admire? And the only thing better is to stand and look at the actual scene, except it keeps moving, whereas the portrait is freeze-framed, and you get to study the details of it. And by portrait, I mean not necessarily a person's face, but something with background, magnificent building, gloriously beautiful mountains, whatever it might be, powerful river. Well, I think this is something that we might find helpful this Sabbath. We need to know where God's love for us comes from. We don't often talk about it that way. We just talk about the warm feeling inside, the emotion of God's love. Emotion isn't good enough. You want convictions. Surface emotions are okay, they enhance life, appreciate that. But when everything is said and done, they're vapor. What we really need are convictions. Those are feelings that aren't just feelings. Those are feelings that are based on truth and character and a solid decision to do something and to be somebody that God wants us to be. Now here's, a, here's an interesting point, and this is this is really an advertising for another sermon I'm working on right now. The front of the, front of the human brain is called the cerebral cortex. Uh, it was Ogden Nash that said, uh, when, they, when they do a frontal lobotomy, it weakens a person's will, but it's a brain surgery that has big impact on the mind. Ogden Nash was a silly poet back in the 30s, and he said, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Well, he's talking about the cerebral cortex. That's the part of the brain where it, 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 they map brains now. Well, you know, they can do that by which part of the brain is, is firing its synapses and giving off its little electrical pulses that they can measure when you're doing math or analyzing something. And that's, that's up front. Then once you have analyzed something, you've determined that it's valid, then there is, when you, over a period of time and repeatedly analyzed it, it takes a number of times for this to happen, then that shifts to the midbrain. But in the midbrain is also where emotion registers. That's where your feelings, you know, as far as the, 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 the brain being a marvelous organ that God made, that's where the, the emotions are processed in the, the midbrain, is what they refer to it. And there's a nice fancy Latin term for it, which I can't remember right now. But in English, we would understand it more as the midbrain. And that's where emotion takes place, but that's also where the convictions are stored. That's where that rock solid recognition, in our case of God's truth, is stored as far as the, the brain location. 
of course, it's stored in, in, in the spirit in man, that which gives us intellectual capability that animals don't have, and is stored in the connection of the spirit in man and God's spirit after conversion. So what we're looking at is something that is going to hit there as conviction and will be enhanced by emotion, but it is that marvelous picture of God's throne. You ever think about God's throne, where, where God's love comes from, because that's where he is. Uh, let's go back to Colossians and start wading through the power of God's throne. Colossians chapter 3 in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3 is, uh, the Apostle Paul here is, is bringing out a particular point. He says, it's, uh, we'll look at the first uh, one, two, three, uh, four verses. Let's do the first two to start with. Verses one and two. If you then were raised with Christ. Now what he is referring to here, he wrote, was also inspired to write in Romans 6, that when a person goes into the, the water and is immersed in the water, it's like a, a symbolic gray, a burial. And then you come up out of the water and you walk in newness of life. You're raised up out of the water. It's symbolic of in anticipating the resurrection when Christ returns. So if you then were raised with Christ, because Christ hasn't returned yet, so if this is a raise that is referenced to the baptism, then seek those things which are above. Now you have settled what your spiritual convictions are. And they're logged deeply in the brain and in God's spirit that works with the brain. Seek those things which are above. Where, and when it says which are above, it's the next part of the sentence, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. That's on his throne. Actually, it's on the Father's throne. Christ sits on the throne with the Father. So it makes me wonder, is it... Two thrones, two separate chairs. The thrones are typically chairs. Um, or is it a bench? You know, we talk about the, the bench in reference to the judicial bench uh, and lawyers, you know, being on the bench in, the, in that sense because they can sometimes be judges. But whatever the case, he is sitting at the right hand of God the Father on the throne of God. So we should consider those things that are above. Seek the throne of God. What does it look like? What is, what is the impact it should have in our minds? We talk about God's love, but we seldom paint the picture of his throne. Set your mind on things above. Looking at the throne of God can have a powerful impact for the good, an inspiring impact. You can be totally uplifted by thinking about what God's throne is like and the fact that it's God's throne and he's on it. And he's watching you think and reading what you think. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, and that was through repentance, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. His shed blood covers our sins. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And so will all of our spiritual forebears. We'll all be there. So, Christ comes from the Father's throne. He came from the Father's, man, well, his throne first to be, live a human life as a part of the family of God and thus qualify to cover the sins of all mankind throughout history. And he will come again. It's time to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And that's, as you know, the not too distant future. Let's go to another place where the Apostle Paul was inspired to write about it. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. There were a number of men who had visions of God's throne. They saw it in vision. Um, some of the prophets, some of the apostles. Uh, here's where Paul saw the throne, 2 Corinthians 13. But Isaiah also had a vision. It's recorded in Isaiah 6. Fascinating to read. He had a vision of God's throne, and he was totally awestruck by it. Now, we aren't necessarily going to, did I say 13? I mean 2 Corinthians 12. 
We aren't necessarily going to be awestruck as much as Isaiah was because he was speechless. He fell on the ground as if he was dead. And then in Ezekiel, let me see, that's chapter 3 and 4, I believe, in Ezekiel. You can double check that. He also was given the vision. He saw the throne of God in vision. Not literally, he didn't go to heaven, neither did Paul here. He saw what it was like. God revealed it to him, and God can do that. He can, we can, he can transfigure himself. He did that in front of Peter and, and James and John. In Matthew 17, one of the places that's recorded, called the vision of the transfiguration. They didn't go to heaven, and they didn't see Moses and Elijah, because Moses and Elijah are in their graves. But they will appear, just like they appeared in the vision that those apostles got to see. And Christ was transfigured before them, so they saw what he looks like in his glorified condition. Well, that's what it is like to study God's throne. So here it is in Paul's, so Paul's opportunity in vision. Un, uh, you know, a surreal amount of uh, perception, so it makes him wonder, was it a vision or was I there? And he, he doesn't say it was him, but he says somebody he knew, and we pretty well figure it was him. It is doubtlessly, doubtless not profitable for me, in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 11, or chapter 12, rather. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I would come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. It was so real. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven, now, let me pause there. The third heaven is where God's throne is. That is, when we talk about heaven above, that's what we're talking about. Now, you might ask, so what are the other two heavens, if that's the third one? Well, the first heaven is where the birds fly and the jets fly. And the second heaven is deep space. And the third heaven has a spiritual address. Everything else is a physical address. Spiritual, the third heaven is where God is. And that is a spiritual address. We don't exactly know how it juxta juxtapositions with our physical addresses, but God knows. So we don't have to worry about it. So he was caught up to the third heaven in this vision. And it is a vision that really he's talking about. And I, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. How he was caught up into paradise because it was where God was. And he heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. He heard God speaking. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. So that's why he used the literary technique of, uh, I know this person who had this vision and literally saw in the vision God the Father and the Son in the third heaven. Paul's vision was remarkable. You know, it is the true paradise, the, the true ultimate experience, which we will also experience in the kingdom of God going into eternity. Although the kingdom of God won't be in the third heaven. And that's a radical and remarkable thing. And we, have, we understand as a part of our inner convictions, for we came to understand it from God's word. It'll actually be on earth. Granted, it will be a new earth. A new earth that will last forever. In other words, the third heaven is coming to the new earth. The third heaven in the person of Jesus Christ and God the Father in the course of the unfolding of God's plan. Now, how did this impact Paul? Let's notice the next few verses from verse 7 to 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure in the abundance of the revelations, because he had many revelations, God taught Christ manifested himself to teach him personally for three years, this is recorded in Galatians, early chapters of Galatians, taught him personally after he was converted, so he had as much instruction as the other 12 apostles had. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be, exa I be exalted above measure. Now, Paul, we, uh, the picture we have of Paul, that as a human being, he was, he was pretty cocky. 
You know, he a little bit of a superior attitude. I think that was well displayed in the fact that he, you know, powerfully and vehemently persecuted the church. And so God knew that he needed to be deflated just a little. So he had, uh, had this thorn in the flesh. And you think, well, what in the world was it? Well, based on other comments in the epistles, it seems to be his eyes. He couldn't see well. He talks about that. In the end of Galatians, he said, with, See with such large a letter I have written to you. Meaning he actually wrote the letter himself, but the Greek letters as he was writing them were very large so he could see what he was writing. And it's, it's hard to, be, to project an attitude and fall back into that superior attitude when you can't see very well. And you're talking to a post instead of a person. You know, it just doesn't have the panache that, you know, lecturing somebody uh, over lecturing something. So he said, I have, it has buffeted me, that I be, lest I be exalted above measure. And in verse 8, and concerning this thing, I have pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, there are times in our lives when we feel weak. Now, I don't mean spiritually weak because we are compromising on God's law and violating his ways. I don't mean that kind of weak. I mean weak in being buffeted by circumstances. Weak because of the trials we are going through. Paul went through this trial, and it helped to keep him humble and strengthened him. But we are made stronger by the trials God allows us to have and even sometimes specifically gives us Therefore, most gladly, he continues, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. I don't know that that's required, you know, to be thankful for the migraine headache. Uh, although there is one nice thing about migraine headaches, for those of you who have them, I have them periodically when I, you know, get a nerve pinch in my neck when the neck's out of place is it's so nice when it's gone. You're, you almost feel slightly euphoric. Oh, wow. You know, I just feel so good. And you didn't feel good at all while you were having it. So, uh, you know, you take pleasure maybe in the infirmity, the post-infirmity stage. In, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we feel weakened by the onslaught, that is a growth time, just like it said in Ecclesiastes. It's a time for growing, consolidating. It is a time for turning feelings and truth together, locking them together into convictions that will carry us forward as the servants of God. And a deeper love for God and a deeper dedication to his service. Now let's Let's look at, and this is still Paul, those related to Paul. It's in Acts chapter 7. And here we have a man who has a vision, a short vision, but a vision, of the third heaven, of God's throne. He sees this vision, and it enables him to do what in his case God has called him to do. The man's name is Stephen. In Hebrew, Stephen, Estefan, that's uh, T-S-A-F-U-N, usually is how it's spelled in English letters, means hidden. His name means hidden, as in things that are hidden, or God's people who are hidden by God from danger at times. Well, Stephen was the first martyr of the New Testament church after Christ, of course. And we find this, uh, begin in verse 54. When they heard these things, because he's, he gives the conclusion to his, his full message here. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth, the, these being the Jews who were hearing him. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heaven opens, the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
Now to them that was blasphemy because they didn't believe that Jesus, who this was just a rabbi in their eyes, a teacher, that they didn't like and didn't agree with, they considered this to be blasphemy. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they stoned Stephen, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he, when he had said that, he fell asleep. And the Bible describes death as a sleep. But Stephen was given this momentary vision of God's throne. And it empowered him. It strengthened him. It was a huge affirmation that what he was doing was what Christ wanted him to be doing right there, right then. And he died well and honorably. And we will have our opportunity to salute Stephen when the kingdom comes. But that dramatic power of envisioning God's throne and God on it and Christ on his throne at the right hand of the Father or in Stephen's case, Christ standing up. Why would he be standing when Stephen is about to die? He is cheering him on. He's up and out of his throne, out of his chair, as it were, and cheering Stephen on. And that because the other places, he's seated on his throne by the Father. Let's consider the location and the majesty of God's throne. Uh, number one, we have an orientation. As I said, it has a different address than, than Earth or any place else in the universe, which is physical. It's spiritual, so it is someplace spiritual. Uh, Psalm 75 gives us a little inkling here. We're going through Psalms right now in the writings class, and it's amazing how many prophecies and how much doctrine and how much additional detail besides singing praises to God are woven into these magnificent poetic uh, lyrics. Psalm 75. Okay, here we are. Um, we'll jump into the middle of it in verse 6. For exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts one down and exalts another. And they, well, that, that wasn't everything there. We got all three points of the compass, except that there are four. North wasn't mentioned. Somehow, exaltation comes from where God is. God is where his throne is. And somehow, the throne, which is in the third heaven, is north of the earth. Now, I don't know how the physical location of earth transposes to the spiritual location of God's throne, but God says it's north, so it's north. This is affirmed in Isaiah chapter 14. This is the rebellion of Lucifer. starts out as a, pro, as a uh, judgment against a particular king of Babylon. It doesn't list who the king is. But the poem, as poems can do, can take a turn. And suddenly you're talking about one person, and then suddenly the tone changes. This isn't that person. This is somebody else. And not somebody else's actually name, starting in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now, he's an angel. He's going to go to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Well, the stars of God, that's symbolic language for angels. It's used in a number of places in the Bible. So he was a leading angel in his day before he rebelled. So he, he was going to exalt his throne above all the angels. But he goes on. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Hold it. That's where God is. Yeah, that's what he just said. He's going to take God's throne. 
That's Satan's attitude. He wants God's throne. And it's not his to have. It's not his to have. But it is in the farther sides of the north. So you see it's connected. He goes on with this, I, there are five eyes here. I will ex ascend. I will exalt. I will sit. I will ascend the second time above the heights of the clouds. I will be like, in the King James, the, the, the like is in italics, and so it's added for try to make it clearer. But if you take it out, I will be the Most High. He wanted to be God. That's a technical impossibility. But when you're demented, impossibilities don't seem to register. And the devil is demented. In fact, his name was changed from light bringer, that's what Lucifer means, or morning star, day star. It was changed to devil, which means accuser or slanderer, and Satan, which means enemy or adversary. But here we have the reference that God's throne is, in fact, the north. Now let's go to Ezekiel, because Ezekiel has some really remarkable, a couple of really remarkable things to see, say about God's throne and, and the impact that it have, has on us. Um, First, let's note uh, Ezekiel 43, and we'll back up to verse chapter 28 in just a moment, but in, in chapter 43. Now, 43, chapter 43 is in the middle of chapters 40 to 48, which is, brings the conclusion of Ezekiel. Those eight chapters, or is it nine? It would be nine chapters if you're count, counting 40. Describe the millennial temple. Now, Christ will come back from Revelation 20. He'll return to the earth, and he will rule from Jerusalem for a thousand years. He will rule all the earth and all the nations will be ruled by him. And then there's another time after that and until it's time for the Father to come. Uh, but we won't get into all those details today, but suffi sufficient to say he'll rule for a thousand years. He will have, because Jerusalem will still be a physical city, although Christ is spirit and the resurrected saints are spirit. And with the capability, as Jesus did in the Old Testament before his human birth, manifesting himself physically as needed. Uh, he will well, rule today. from the temple so in, in Jerusalem, and it will be different and, uh, than the temple um, of Solomon, bigger. Being, being a student. Uh, well, he will today. rule from the temple so anyway, of in Jerusalem, and it will be and, different uh, than the temple uh, of Solomon, bigger. Being, being a student now at ABC has, has been We've a heard that before. <laughs> you know, this happened one other time that we didn't hear it during the service. It was in the Feast in Reading back in 1996. I gave a sermon called the Submarine Sermon. It had a better title than Submarine, but we were, we was uh, imagining that we were in a submarine, you know, looking under the sea to see how the waters cover the sea because the knowledge of God will cover the earth like that in the millennium. And when it got the recording, it had a nice clear channel for 20 seconds and then it started again. And so you, you had, I had my voice, I was trying to listen to it uh, one day, and you simply couldn't. It had two tracks, it got recorded simultaneously but with a 20 second lag. Drove you nuts trying to figure out, you know, keep up with the, what was being said. All right, anyway, back, back on task here if we could. Uh, chapter 43, verses 10 to 12. We went to Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago with the, the ABC choir, and well, the ABC class. It was their class trip. This class gets to go to Chicago to see some of the impressive sites there. And there are a number of things that are impressive that man has built in, in Chicago and certainly in Washington, D.C. I was truly impressed by some of our great national buildings. You know, kind of saddened, too, right now when you go and consider what this nation is doing and in a way it's moving away from the values of the of God's word what with the ones it did have but I was still impressed by the buildings they were really amazing uh, I remember also years ago when I attended Ambassador College when we had that and we Linda and I were attending uh, in England at the English campus that we had in those days this would be the 70s we had a faculty member who became a member of a gentleman's club. He was a, 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 a Briton, an Englishman, uh, completely independently wealthy. He was also in the ministry and served as our business manager. But he joined the, the Reform Club. Now, if you've ever read 
the book or watched uh, one of the movies called Around the World in 80 Days. Uh, hopefully you have. If you haven't, there's a, there are a couple of good versions of it that are just a delight to watch. Phineas J. Fogg is the hero of the story. And he is a member of the Reform Club. And I had no idea, being an American from South Dakota, that there was such a real club. I thought it was fictitious. Great story. I loved it when I read it. Came to, went to England to Ambassador College, and what do you know, there was an actual <laughs> reform club. And when uh, this, this minister, uh, Mr. Bergen, got to be a member of it, and the only way you could become a member of it is you had to be quite wealthy and have you know, a very distinct family line that would be in the gentleman class and almost the nobility class. And then six people had to vouch for you who uh, were of equal standing in society, the proper English way. America doesn't do that. Uh, well, I guess we do, but not quite as proper as the English. And then somebody had to die of old age. And, and then you could be in the reform club. So he got, he got in, uh, that was my last year. We went to dinner there a couple of times, actually. I remember what I had, multi gatani soup. It was an Indian soup, very hot uh, curry. So it was delicious. Anyway, we walked in, and you have these giant marble pillars that are holding the place up. They're in the front, outside, and then on the inside. And I, as I looked at the building, both outside and inside, I was impressed. This spoke British Empire like nothing else. It was more impressive than Buckingham Palace, which looks like a really big house, uh, maybe an apartment building. You know, it's just not that impressive. But the Wigan, but the, that that club, the Wigan Pen Club, was another club he was part of. Um, you had to be a corporate lawyer to get in there. It wasn't quite as impressive, but it was an older one. But the Reform Club was truly an impressive building. All right. Point made. Let's go to chapter 43, and uh, we want to read verses 10 to 12. Son of man, that's what God called Ezekiel all the time. In, in that sense, Ezekiel was a type. He was a human being, but a type of Christ. Some of what he was doing, Christ would per carry on. And one of the key things about Ezekiel is that Christ himself referred to himself by the way he referred to Ezekiel, because this would be Christ before his human birth talking to Ezekiel in this vision that he was having. Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel. This is not the temple that they were familiar with, which in Ezekiel's day was destroyed, but this is the one that will be built in the millennium, and it's different, it's bigger. It's much more impressive even than Solomon's temple. Describe the temple to the house of Israel, and why? Why would he describe it? And get this, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities or their sins. So hearing about the temple should make them ashamed of their sins. Now that you have to wrap your mind around. Have you ever looked at a building that made you feel bad about yourself and your behavior? Properly bad. I, I don't mean, you know, the, the bad where you need therapy. I'm talking about properly bad for, because of the things that you have done or haven't done. And let them measure the pattern, it goes on to say. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done and make, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangements and its exits and its entrances and its entire design and all its ordinances and all its forms and all its laws by which the priesthood will go about their business of making offerings and conducting services and the singing that will go with it, write it down in their sight so that they may keep its whole design and all its ordinances and perform them. This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. Now in the temple of Solomon, the most holy place was the small anteroom at the western end of the building that opened up to the east into the main holy place of the temple. And then that opened up to the east out into the courtyard of the temple. Well, here we have the entire mountaintop is like that holy of holies, that is, it is called. In Hebrew, when you emphasize something, you say it twice. So holy, holy is how this is recorded in Hebrew. 
That, that means good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better best. That means it is the best. It's the superlative. Behold, this is the law of the temple. So here we have viewing the temple, which in the millennium will be where the throne, the throne of Christ will be located, is to make us feel ashamed of our sins. It is to take our breath away. It is to humble us before God. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because we see what God has made and that this is the location, this is the presence of God, this is where he is, and in, in this case, uh, Jesus Christ. Later, God the Father will come down. We'll read about that in a minute. But as you stop and mull that over, you begin to realize, wow, to envision the throne of God strengthens us spiritually because it motivates us to overcome. We see where our failings are. We marvel at where God is and the, the law of the throne, if you will, as well as the law of the temple, which was uh, symbolic of God's throne. So let's go and look then at the, prof the prophecies that describe the temple of God. In Revelation chapter 1, we start. Revelation chapter 1, this is uh, verse 10. We'll read verse 10. The Apostle John wrote this. It was a vision. The whole thing was a vision that he saw. And so he, like Ezekiel, wrote down the vision. Like Isaiah, he wrote down the vision he saw. And like Paul, he wrote down the vision he saw. Stephen didn't have time to write his down, but somebody else did. In verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That is not Sunday. That is a prophetic time that takes place during the overall time frame we commonly refer to as the Great Tribulation, immediately prior to the return of Christ, the Lord's Day. And I heard a voice, or behind me, a loud voice, as of a trumpet. It, just, it was so incredibly loud and, and melodious. And I turned to see the voice that had spoken to me in verse 12. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. To John, he was recognizable. John had been Christ's best friend and referred to himself as that uh, in so many words several times in his, uh, his uh, gospel account. Uh, many scholars think that John and his brother James were actually first cousins to Jesus Christ because their mothers were sisters. Mary and, and their mother were sisters. And, and that's possible. But whatever the case, one like the Son of Man, he would know what the Son of Man looked like. He would recognize him. Clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band, and his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet were like fine brass, as it is refined in a furnace, and his voice glowing, in other words, and his glowing, or so rather, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And he had in his hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword, meaning a description of God's word. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Completely awestruck was, was John when he saw this vision of Christ. Now, in a minute, we'll read where Christ was. But in order to envision the throne of God, you have to envision the Father and the Son who sit on it. This is what the Christ looks like. The Father will look similar, be, you know, be, appear similarly. Today we're driving down on a beautiful sunny day, and you know, every so often you, the, the sun gets at a, at a certain angle. The back window of the car ahead of you starts blinding you. Well, that almost happened. You know what prevented it? Salt. Windows are all dirty right now of the storm we had and then melting snow and the slush and all that sort of thing. So it was, it was not quite as bright and blinding as it normally is, but for John to see Christ like this, shining like the sun, was blinding. Impressive. Phenomenal. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, we begin to read about the throne room of, of heaven. And after those things, we were going to read the first 11 verses of chapter 4. First 11 verses. And after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Now this is the third heaven that Paul talked about. 
And the first voice I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me. Come up here. Come up here and I will show you things that must take place after this. And immediately I was in the spirit. In other words, in this vision. And behold, there a throne set in heaven. So here we have the, the vision of God's throne. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. A rainbow. Now the rainbow is a symbol of God's promise not to destroy man by a flood. Again, like he did before. And when it says it's like an emerald, I wonder. We normally have sort of pastel colored rainbows now. But what would a rainbow be like where every color is intense in its full intensity as a color? And that, maybe that's what it's like. Otherwise, it's just a green rainbow. I'm not sure. Either way, I'm happy. But I suspect that it is like an emerald in the sense that the green portion of the, the rainbow is intensely green, thus the other colors would be too. And around the throne were 24 thrones. So there are these other thrones, two dozen of them. And on these thrones, I saw 24 elders. There is no man in heaven now. No man has ascended into heaven, Jesus said in the book of John, except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. So these are angels angelic elders there are billions of elders based on comments about the angels so obviously there will be leaders among them and they were sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads and from the throne the main throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of god and before the throne, there was a sea of glass. Now, thunder with lightnings are emanating from God's throne. And on a sea of glass, you have what is referred to back in Ezekiel 28, which I forgot to read when we were there. Uh, this is another description of Lucifer's rebellion. But it talks about him cast away from the fiery stones. It's a sea of glass in front of God's throne with lightning flashing through it. And even, even here in, in the physical world, uh, glass is a stone, it's silica. So the fiery stone was that lightning from emanating from God's throne through the, through the glass, thus the fiery stones of Ezekiel 28. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion and the second one like a calf or a bull, an ox actually. The third creature had a face like a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Those were cherubim. They're described, Ezekiel and Isaiah saw them too, and they record in their prophecies of the throne of God those angelic beings as well. Now we also know that there are two cherubim that stand either to one to each side or kneel one to each side of God's throne, and they have long wings that overstretch the throne of God. We know that because on the, on the Ark of the Covenant, there are two cherubim whose wings in statuary, whose wings overspread the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is a statuary depiction of God's throne that God had commissioned to be carved and overlaid with gold on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It was the covering of the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat was on there, those two cherubim there. So we have, we have from here, we know there's a rainbow overarching that. Then the cherubim that cover the throne with their wings, overspread it. And then we have these four living creatures that are at the sides of their corners, apparently, of God's throne. Each having six wings, full of eyes around and within. They don't rest night or day, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is and was and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give honor and glory and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, and the 24 elders then fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. So the angels worship God just like we should worship God. And they cast their crowns before the throne. So they don't do it constantly, but they do it regularly. And they get their thrones and then they get back on, or get their crowns and they get back on their thrones and can do whatever it is that God has for them to do. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So God created his throne. He created everything else. The throne, though, is where the Father is. 
Now let's go uh, to the next passage. It's right here in chapter 5. We just continue on. Verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and out. Now a scroll was a long piece of parchment or vellum. Vellum would be leather, normally lambskin. Parchment would be made out of uh, reeds. It was a type of paper, ancient paper. Either way, it would be rolled up and the scroll would be basically round. And so God's got the scroll in his hand. The Father has the scroll in his hand. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, in verse 2, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And, and so John, this impacted John, he, he's seeing all this, he is absolutely awestruck because of the magnificence and the beauty and, and he's completely humbled. So was Isaiah, so was Ezekiel when this happened to them. So he was completely humbled and he wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Then one of the elders, one of these 24 angelic elders said to me, do not weep, it's okay. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So this is a ceremony. Who can open the scroll? And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had, it had been slain, having seven horns and uh, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now this lamb is actually Christ. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. So they fell down, they worshiped the lamb. They worshiped the father and they worshiped the lamb. So the lamb is Christ. And he came over, he, he walked over to the father and received the scroll. And this is the new song that the 24 elders created, representative of the prayers of the saints. So they're singing it from the perspective of the, the in the future to be resurrected human beings. You are worthy, oh, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us. So the us is not themselves, but it's the saints. You have redeemed us to God by your blood for out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. And then he looked and I, he, he said, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. So we have a choir of angels around the throne the living, and the living creatures and elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and 10 thousands of thousands billions essentially saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every living creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying blessing and honor as it were you know we have even inanimate objects here praising God so it, as it were they are because they are the product of his creation Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the twenty-four creatures, or the four living creatures, said Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. That is a picture of God's throne. Completely awestruck, the Apostle John, and it did Isaiah, as it did Ezekiel, as it did anybody else who saw it, as it did Peter and James and John, when they just simply they didn't see the entire throne of. Christ and the Father, but they saw Christ manifested before them. And what Ezekiel and Moses, or Elijah and Moses will look like in the day, it has a phenomenal impact to envision this. Now, I, I describe this, and the goal of the sermon is to help you to begin to capture the vision of what God's throne is like, to try to imagine it sometimes when you're praying. What is it like? Where are my prayers going to? Because the prayers of the saints go to the Father. It's, we just read that. They're right there in, in verse 8. So where's the destination? And sometimes if we can see it in our mind's eye, 
It is a brilliant brightness and light. It's called a great white throne later in, in Revelation 20. And it is glorious and magnificent beyond anything we've ever seen physically. It pulsates with the power of all existence. It is the place of the Father and the Son who made everything and everybody. That is the, that is the direction we are sending our prayers, north, somehow north. And to imagine that, to think about that, and to realize that exists, it has always existed. And here we are on this physical earth in our physical bodies, anticipating the time when we will share that level of existence with the Father and the Son as his children in the kingdom of God. But just sometimes you need to think about what God's throne is like. There's another reason too. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. When you're impressed by the temple, you know, in the millennium, you know, to tell them what the temple is going to look like. Give them the dimensions. Lay down the blueprint. They will be humbled and they'll be ashamed of their behavior when they see what a magnificent building and all that that implies is the building implies the, the existence of those who built it and the other work that they do. And the, tab, the, the temple of the millennium, as even Solomon's temple was, was impressive and awe-inspiring that the hand of man, which was created by God, could put that together according to God's directions. And that that carried God's authority and, and carried God's presence in the Shekinah, as it's called by the Jews. Uh, the divine presence of God was in the Temple of Solomon. It will certainly be in the Temple of the Millennium. And the Millennium Temple is to humble us just to know about it. What will it be like for human beings to actually go there and see it when they're truly trying to follow God and worship him? For us to be able to envision God's throne now in our prayers, periodically, mulling it over, meditating on it sometimes, what does it look like? Try to get a picture in your mind, and it's hard. We can't fill all the details in, but it is impressive, magnificent, bright, very bright, with intense colors too. And then we have a picture of what Christ looks like from Revelation 1. The Father is going to look like that too. And we are just physical, little low human beings. But we have a destiny that is going to be like the throne of God, which is coming here. Hebrews chapter 4, though, I want you to understand this. We go to that throne more often than we remember, I think. But maybe now we'll think about it when we go there. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 14, to begin. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And what had preceded was a description of Christ's role as high priest. And he'll be the high priest of that temple in the millennium the ultimate high priest. He'll be also the king of kings and lord of lords. He will hold all the high authority, responsibilities, and positions on the, in the entire world. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Christ understands what we're experiencing. He knows when we're sad. He understands sadness. He, had, he was sad, too, many times. He understands pain. He went through pain. He understands loss. He understands feelings of inadequacy because he had to experience being human after being divine. He understands those things. This is good. This is something that we can, you know, to put it in paltry terms, bank on. We can use and be strengthened by it. He was in all points tempted, as we are, but without sin. Oh, you mean somebody can reject temptation and live without sin? Yes, it's been done. Christ did it. Now, there, if that should strengthen us when we face temptation of any kind, 
Christ rejected it, so it didn't become a sin. So can we. Let us therefore, and we get back to God's throne, let us therefore, with this in mind, go boldly to the throne of grace. And what's the throne of grace? It is God's throne. In the third heaven, where the Father and the Son have their seating places. Surrounded by the four living creatures and the 24 elders out in front, overshadowed by the, the wings of the cherubim and then by the rainbow and lightnings and thunderings and a sea of crystal and thousands and thousands and millions and millions of angels coming and going and singing and, and worshiping God at the same time. That's our throne of grace, and we can come boldly to that throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And the beauty of this is, as I had been mentioning, the throne that Christ will bring to the earth that he will sit on will be joined with the Father. Go back to Revelation for our concluding passage. Verse 1 of chapter 21 talks about a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth has passed away, and there was no more sea. And then, John says in verse 2 of Revelation 21, the, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from the Father, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. If Christ is already here, and we have now a new earth, with a new heaven around it, and you would seem that it would probably be spirit rather than physical, now the Father comes down. The third heaven is vacated, and the new earth is the center of all that exists. And the marvel of it is, brethren, that that is where resurrected humans will be. Those who have come to Jesus Christ, accepted his sacrifice for their sins, repented of their sins, and have become overcomers, as is talked about in chapter 22. That is where they'll be. That's where the throne of God will be. And we are promised, also in Revelation, it was chapters 2 and 3, multiple times, that if we overcome and endure to the end, we too will sit on Christ's throne with him. The glory of God's throne is truly powerful and inspiring, and I hope that we can spend some time meditating on it, reviewing these passages, and thinking about the power of God's throne and being appropriately strengthened and humbled at the same time.